yeah uh, good morning uh, everybody indeed okay. it's pleasure and honor uh, to talk in front of my teachers and then uh, thanks for this opportunity dr dasagaro sir when i first saw dr samudraj and krishnan raj i was uh, surprised actually uh, thank you sir for joining in you people are role models for younger generation you see only 30 40 of younger people join but all of you are there on time and uh, start everything on time that's what we have to learn uh, from all of you thank you again but uh, topic which i was uh, asked to speak uh, by dr dayasagar actually uh, angiogram would have been first then this would have been uh, next that would have been better but anyway for various reasons uh, what i was supposed to speak on uh, the intracoronary imaging intravascular ultrasound and oct how they help in diagnosis and management of uh, patients i think uh, uh, what uh, i thought it basically a fellows course like and i thought i would cover more of basics i request all the seniors to excuse me for covering up these basics uh, and and uh, this is again a little uh, statement i wanted to make because students uh, nowadays do uh, students and younger people also do lot of things some of the things we do may have no scientific basis and have a significant bias suppose if i am interventional cardiologist and uh, each of us could have our own biases but the more we do the we learn more the more we practice the luckier we get many ways to reach the same goal the goal is again to do what is good for the patients but never compromise on what is good for the patient try and do what is good for the patients to the best of our abilities and efforts i just wanted to make this very clear because uh, people do imaging and then uh, without acting on it uh, just for the sake of doing it it's not the right thing so what is good for the patients we need to always practice and encourage this uh, in juniors best wishes from apollo group of hospitals proud to present my fax professional service colleagues which run in hospitals in multiple in a hub and spoke model this has been very useful especially these tough times of covid helping each other and also getting referral patterns for tower and other programs which have been effectively being done coming back to the agenda of uh, today's talk uh, i just cross checked with dr dayasagar again whether i have one hour's time he said the entire one hour you can talk so i thought uh, i'll talk for about 50 minutes uh, cover initially about uh, this is the agenda what i would do basically introduce uh, and then present some of our nic data which i was fortunate to collect and tell you briefly about pitfalls of angiography and advantage of in intracoronary imaging the types of imaging obviously we know these two are uh, presently practiced cover up ivs in the first uh, 20 minutes or so with basics and image interpretation am i audible sir is it okay yes yes you are very much audible and then show you some case examples for comparison and then try to make simplify the oct it cover up the basics of oct like mld max concepts and then uh, show you some examples of left main and how this imaging helps in bifurcation case examples and if time permits i'd also show some multi vessel uh, disease cases and then in the end to conclude uh, this is uh, i was fortunate to collect our data in my alma mater sgpgi uh, this what is presented you see this uh, huge number of cases uh, 438000 351 cases have got uh, collected up, uh, in our uh, country and out of which left main constitutes about 2.5% and single vessel multi vessel are shown there and what is relevant for today's talk is the imaging uh, it is quite uh, heartening to note that significantly uh, increasing number of centers are doing imaging about uh, overall 4.2% uh, of these cases uh, imaging help was taken is quite less compared to what is recommended in the worldwide but at least we are progressing in the right direction the strength of india is the 4.2% becomes 18514 cases so that's where if we can team up ourselves and then probably get out good data it goes a long way left main imaging again uh, about 35% of left main imaging was i help of uh, imaging was taken so that is a in brief about uh, our country's data or whatever we could collect coming to the pitfalls of the angiography if, there, if it is a central concentric lesion there is no problem but if the eccentric lesion like this If the image go like we take a rf view it, it may not show any lesion at all because the lesion is there the other side and if you see uh, if it's coming like this then you could overestimate also so whenever the lesions are eccentricity we know the problems uh, the, when the concentric lesion is like this whichever view you take it manifests as stenosis in both views but if the eccentric disease like this you could see it in one view and you may not see it to move in view tight and other view you may not see it on the other hand if you have some eccentric and lobulated lesions like this we could miss out totally and we can think that uh, this sort of things we were missing in angiography era before 
So these sort of things we became more wiser once we have the imaging. I always ask this question to fellows: if the lesion is seen like this in one view, like mild in other view, which we should take? Probably we will find more answers to this in the imaging talks further. Then if a vessel is diffusely diseased, again, sometimes we underestimate and uh, because the reference segment itself is diseased. So these all we know when we are seeing the exact vessel diameters and the imaging. The positive remodeling concepts and negative remodeling concepts also started becoming clear, more with BVS uh, era coming up and the arteries uh, tend to dilate themselves and try to adjust the lumen. These sort of things all we became wiser after this. If you see this, uh, proximal LED, somebody had stented with 2.5 stent, which is uh, grossly underdeployed for this. If you really see the measurements in this, it is 4 mm there. So, and obviously the patient comes back with restenosis. This was more uh, in presence of proximal LED disease and the vessel diameters being uh, uh, estimated very small. Angiography versus IVUS, if patient has diabetes and the patient has proximal lesions, there was more of discordance between patients who had diabetes and the proximal vessels compared to the distal vessels. So that's why the proximal vessels, especially when you're doing left main, it is more relevant to do intravascular ultrasound. Some of the advantages compared to intravascular ultrasound are mentioned here. The great is the quality of pictures and what we have inside the lumen also, inside the walls we can make out by intravascular ultrasound. But the strength of angiography have been, it is extensively used since last 60 years. Entire coronary anatomy, including the flow patterns, can be seen well. All of us are more comfortable with it. And it has a lot of positive predictive values and correlated well with UCA. And it, we all are comfortable in clinical decision-making process. But the bad things about angiography is, as I've shown, eccentric stenosis, we tend to miss it. And smiler dissections. And then again, we don't have too much of correlation with physiology, though we have some studies which have come up. So these are the good and bad about the angiography. Coming to the IVUS, uh, the good thing about IVUS is basically the vessel wall, not only the wall and the inside, the lumen visualization is possible. And the plaque characterization, that's how which plaques tend to worsen, which is all that information we have more with this intravascular ultrasound. Then, uh, but the negative thing is actually we need, again, have a separate machines and then the cost of it and the cost of the catheters. And then while doing also, you need to have, take precautions and have that expertise. Then another pitfall of IVUS is basically uh, what is mentioned is disadvantages. The catheter tends to image always in the circular uh, perpendicular pattern like this, but sometimes you could get pictures in this oblique pattern, overestimating the uh, vessel uh, diameters and sizes. We need to be careful about it. So in this comparison, basically, angio is most widely used and convenient. IVUS actually ha helps us to understand more better within the lumen and the walls. And, but we need to know, understand the pitfalls of each of them and use it appro uh, appropriately. Now let us do a little more deep dive into intravascular ultrasound. As I said, IVOS is a technology that allows in vivo visualization of vascular anatomy by utilizing a miniature transducer at the end of flexible catheter. Uh, IVOS, uh, again, this is a basically ultrasound machine which has developed an interface and connection and uh, we are able to see within the coronary arteries. But if you see, that's how the catheter goes in and you visualize the artery like this. Then uh, if you see the first use of IVUS uh, was done in Rotterdam in 1971 by Baum, it was actually done for visualizing cardiac chambers. Then later on, uh, it, luminal images were uh, seen by York and from 1988, it picked up, it evolved like this. And now a uh, lot of developments are happening further in the imaging. This is a console, I, just for sake of juniors, I thought I would just show some of them who are not exposed. Then probably, uh, these are two types of catheters again, phased array and mechanical catheters. Now, both have its advantages and disadvantages of um, mechanical catheters and phased array catheters are mentioned here. Not uh, required to go into all the details, but basically this catheter gets mounted in rapid exchange fashion uh, through the regular wires, what we use, and then the, you get the pictures like this on the, on the uh, machine. Uh, if this is a picture uh, which we took recently from one of these patients. This is a regular wire which it goes, and this is the threading of the IVUS catheter. While you image, then uh, you come back. So you have both uh, mechanical as well as automatic pullbacks uh, by which you image. This is what I was mentioning. As it goes inside, it's actually supposed to take the pictures exactly in the cross-sectional way. Sometimes you could also get an oblique fashion. So that's what uh, we need to be careful. But by and large, in the smaller vessels, it tends to take it OK. This is another picture in which just to get an idea, as you come back, pull back, you can see the entire vessels, lumen and the plaques are mentioned here. I would show you some uh, still pictures later while, while explaining. So if you see this, uh, this is a central is the IVOS catheter. 
and then this is the uh, in, in plaques and then you also get into the all the uh, you can measure exactly the plaque uh, volumes and that's how the regression studies are also seen if you have to see it in a little more detail compared to how it compares with the histology what we have is uh, the intracoronary image of the artery a bright echo from the intima that is what is uh, i is what is intima then you get multiple bright echoes outside that is adventitia and then media looks as a central dark zone in between so this is a comparison with histology with uh, ivas and in, in good quality pictures you get like that and this is a little more higher uh, view of pictures of uh, various layers in the artery so if you have to see the atherosclerotic plaque what we want to know is the plaque extent morphology and composition of the plaque and then our capability is again not only visualize the plaque but we want to see beyond that also and uh, sometimes uh, uh, some of these terminologies i thought uh, again uh, people should understand uh, basically the penetration again uh, depends upon a number of factors including the power of output of transducer and imaging frequency and dynamic range many times it is expressed as this 17 to 55 decibels that basically uh, tells us which is the weakest and which is the strongest targets in which it is seen resolution is another important concept which uh, we need to understand basically the there the three spatial resolutions of resolution is there the resolution is basically the ability to discriminate two closely adjacent objects how if then if they are close if you are able to make out separate that means it has a very high resolution which oct has compared to ivas then resolution could be axial resolution circumferential resolution and the lateral resolution so we need to understand uh, this concepts of regarding resolution and uh, some of the artifacts which you get also we need to know this is a ring down refers to disorganization of image with the catheter is close to the wall you tend to get again uh, i supposed to be in the central location sometimes you get to get those artifacts nerd artifact is again happens most with the uh, mechanical transducers uh, this is uh, some of the portions of the images appear stretched uh, and then the side lobes and the reverberation artifacts caused by false echoes of the intravascular ultrasound yes, whenever you find air bubbles again you get a very weak image when you find like this you need to flush the catheter well and then uh, re do reimaging then perivascular landmarks help us to identify what type of what is that vessel but generally we know by the angio also what uh, vessel we have put in pericardium looks like this uh, then the, the catheter guide wire in the central looks like this and then lad if you have to identify we are very comfortable uh, seeing the angiograms but we also need to know adjacent structures so as to identify these vessels and this right and left uh, intraventricular veins uh, besides it makes tells us that is uh, Uh, LAD and the diagonal origin also tells us. Then the pericardial triangle. When you come more close to the LAD LCX, you make out that you are imaging the proximal portions. As we understand that LCX is again has close proximity, it runs in the AV groove. And uh, if you see it, the great cardiac vein beside it, if you see the channel, that is again we can say it as LCX. Right coronary artery. Again, the same thing on the right side happens. Uh, marginal vein C on the right. And it's also important for us to make out from the branching patterns. so that's about identifying the each of these artery and uh, some of these normals and abnormals if you what uh, i was evolved further is you get a transverse plane uh, cross sectional views but series of multiple uh, fusion of this uh, cross sectional views can become a longitudinal view like this for us and that's what the computer does and shows it and the advantage of it is you can uh, reconstruct the artery entirely to the entire extent and make out the total atheroma volume from a particular point to particular so this is what uh, is the uh, characteristics what we see this is the lumen area this is the plaque area we can calculate and the percentage of uh, plaque area which you get here it's all uh, calculated and it, as shown below you can point you can uh, trace it at any particular point you can calculate it and you can identify what is the normal to normal and then plan the stenting procedure accordingly and some of these confusions happen when you see such occlusion structures whether it is an artifact or within some of the pointers for youngsters to notice if it is happening within the plaque like this if it is a occlusion generally it is unlikely to be artifact it is likely to be a, a plaque uh, which has a soft plaque with inside uh, such things it refers to as a little un unstable plaque soft refers to low echogenicity then uh, you see a dark spaces there that is a soft plaque whereas fibrous plaques again you see it as hyper echoic uh, regions there and mo most of the plaques what we see in uh, day to day practice are fibrotic plaques then this is where uh, imaging helped a lot identifying the calcium calcium discalcific disease 
But the only problem with this calcium with IVERS is once uh, the uh, ultrasound uh, hits the calcium, you don't see anything behind it. It becomes dark. So if you have the length of the circumferential calcium, calcium extending all across, then probably that's where you need to take the help of rotablation and be prepare the bed properly. But if the calcium is extending only to one quarter, less than quarter, and the thickness is very less, that uh, aspects will cover in OCT because OCT is showing the depth of it very clearly. And then the calcium is superficial or calcium is deep inside like this, all these we can make out very clearly by imaging. Then uh, some of this uh, intraluminal, what we said is in the plaque, and in the wall. Now, some of the structures which see in the lumen of the artery, like this, then probably within the lumen, obviously, most of the times we end up with thrombus. And But sometimes within the uh, after you do stenting, you image it, something protrudes inside it. That is the plaque protrusion, which could happen. And uh, these are the, we need to understand this. And then probably also, if there is a gap in, in between, we need to tackle that by further post dilatation. That's where the role of it, it comes in intervention. False lumen, sometimes uh, you also tend to get into, especially in CTOs and other problems. Aneurysms, uh, especially when a drug eluting stent error, you could get true and false aneurysms. These are some of the pictures which you see. And the black holes, it generally it's outdated now. It's, you're supposed to be seen in brachytherapy era. This is where I think uh, all, the, all the youngsters should concentrate and see. After you put a stent, if there's, there's a lot of gap in between the wall and the stent, when you undersize the vessel with a smaller size stent, if you leave it a lot of gaps there, the stent opposition it becomes incomplete, high chance of stent thrombosis if you leave it like that. That's where we need to work on, put as high pressure dilatations and uh, do it. These are uh, scientific statements come from ACCHA and uh, many other organizations to, to how to interpret these images and how we need to express the diagnosis of intravascular uh, ultrasound. I would just briefly mention about this. We take from leading edge to leading edge. What we need to calculate is we need to calculate the proximal reference segment, that is the largest lumen proximal, and distal reference segments go beyond the lesion and calculate distal reference segment. And probably average of it is what we uh, send select size and the type of the lesion and uh, type of plaque inside we need to see. So as I've shown in some of the pictures, what we measure is we measure the cross-sectional lumen area, minimal lumen diameter, and the maximal lumen diameter. And whether the eccentric stenosis or uh, concentric stenosis, what is the area of stenosis? I have shown 65% in one of those pictures. Can, you can make out clearly like that regarding the uh, plaque morphology. If you see it here, again, uh, this is the lumen area which you have it inside. Then uh, this is, if you see uh, the entire extent of the vessel wall here, that is adventitial uh, is beyond it and media to media. That is where you exactly measure uh, the plaque volumes and the intimal thickness. And then uh, you, you tend to measure uh, totally. And that's how this expression of the reporting of intravascular ultrasound has to be done. You see, whenever you find appropriate patient demographic information, we need to write. And we need to have indication for procedure. Why are you planning to do the procedure? Whether it's a diagnostic uh, imaging for assessment of stenotic severity, or you are uh, taking the help of it for intervention. Then brief description of the IVAS procedure, what type of catheter we use, what is the anticoagulation we gave, and what are the coronary arteries which we imaged. And basic findings of the IVAS pullback as a broad you mentioned, uh, from uh, what area to what area you have uh, calculated it, and the plaque morphology, presence of dissections, calcium thrombus, we should go in more detail into the plaque morphology. And then after doing the IVAS in the procedure, uh, what is the outcome change which you have decided? That is whether you are dilated with a more bigger sized balloon and what is the approximation like later, all that. And if at all, if you have any complication like spasm and other problems related to it and how you tackled it. These are the, some of the things which are a descriptive way of using it. I was reporting. I thought I'd briefly mention for the sake of all the youngsters. Nowadays, uh, the reporting patterns go, as Sar was telling, they write only 80% uh, RCS stenosis, not much of details. Similarly, the IOS also is just done and uh, not much of uh, reporting is done for this. I thought uh, I should mention this uh, proper reporting of intravascular ultrasound. I'd briefly go into some of these studies, but I won't bore you with all these uh, deeper studies. Uh, this uh, made us capable to identify the entire extent of the plaque. And that's how this asteroid study, the plaque uh, morphologies, the regression patterns, how it happened with statins is again made out. And these are some of these uh, newer modalities of imaging like virtual histology tells us that how the plaques are getting stabilized, but some of this did not 
become very popular with the advent of OCT. Then a lot of interest in the intravascular imaging is the identification of vulnerable plaque. And uh, these, these pictures, uh, cartoons, you know very well. Initially, people have tried this vulnerable plaque, plaque ruptures, all these uh, documentation, the various types of plaques. And our idea was to identify uh, before somebody becomes unstable and suffers this ACS and uh, uh, acute MIs. The soft plaques, the fibrous plaques, the, and the superficial calcium, deep calcium, all that uh, is shown. Uh, then uh, what people have uh, found, said is uh, if the plaque is unstable, then probably you would have areas of uh, uh, like necrosis and uh, spots and spotty calcium there. And uh, this sort of ruptured plaque cavities could tell us that plaque is becoming unstable. So the eccentric nature, positive remodeling, ulceration, thrombosis, and spotty calcium tell us that plaque is a little vulnerable. This is again helps us in identifying preventing events on the follow. Uh, this is one of the study published before again showed the presence of spotty calcium and eccentricity uh, and uh, positive remodeling will help in identifying. Then atheroma volume burdens, uh, the various trials have used it uh, to calculate regression studies, uh, and especially when high dose statins, this has become possible. The prospect study, again, took the help of uh, as identifying the thin cap fibroatheromas. And there people have compared the uh, ultrasound with CT. All these, would, I would say, is a relatively older studies because a lot of new information is coming up with a more advanced modality of imaging with uh, OCT. Coming to some of these interventional uh, things, what we want is pre-intervention. We want to see the accurate quantification, assessment of a reference segment, strategy for device selection, instant resources. Again, we found out what it is. It And ambiguous appearances, post-intervention, then probably as incomplete opposition, balloon, further uh, angioplasty, high pressure inflations. We have these are the interventional indications for intravascular ultrasound. So instant restenosis, it made a lot of difference for us to understand the pathology of imaging. And then a uh, lot of uh, solutions we are trying to find out. And uh, whenever the areas which you get after the procedure are less than 4.5, then probably there's more chance of patient getting in, uh, into restenosis. And uh, expansion patterns also, if there's, if there's under expansion and more than 50%, then you tend to get into restenosis. That's what some of the studies show. But whenever you do a procedure and post-intervention, you get a, uh, areas of more than 10, there's very minimal chance of getting restenosis. If, that you, if the stent areas are less, then again, you need to, you, you have a higher chance of getting it to restenosis. Then left main also, you have the similar uh, patterns because why stress separately is left main imaging uh, has a lot of importance with uh, intravascular ultrasound, especially the osteal type of lesions are uh, better seen with uh, intravascular ultrasound compared to OCT. The true vessel diameter we can uh, measure uh, by this uh, ultrasound. Then uh, post-intervention, again, the same uh, things which apply for the regular vessels also apply in the left main, more so here. And we always want to get better volume, uh, diameters and areas. Now we have a lot of data coming up with IVAS compared to angiography that IVAS patients do well. And uh, what is the criteria for full optimal stent deployment? We need to get at least more than 7.5, more than 10 is better. And we need to have uh, less of stent under expansion. And uh, these are some of the older studies, which actually were with IVAS, the OCT ones I'll cover up new. But what it showed is basically whenever between the, we also became wiser that uh, drug eluting stents uh, have a, a better, less restenosis. And areas, if it is less than 5.5, lengths being more than 40, now it became 60 with the better quality stents, the chance of restenosis could be high. This is the first study where it identified with cipher with imaging, I just thought I would project that. But basically, it tells us exactly what is the areas we got, we get, and what is the stenosis residual, and what it happens on the follow-up. All these has become possible with imaging, unlike with the only angiogram. This is another study, again, restenosis even with the venous grafts, showed how the near internal hyperplasia happens, how it is different between bare metal and cerulimus. This is a, all these are older studies with IVAS, but uh, uh, some of the newer ones I will do with uh, OCT. Some of these imaging also helped in understanding this pathology of heart transplant patients, where in angiography they were finding it all okay, but when you did the imaging, the diffuse uh, atherosclerosis process was noted in uh, some of these studies. We, it's not uh, very relevant for us, that's why I'm going faster. And the three-dimensional reconstruction, color coding, and this uh, virtual histology didn't work out much uh, for uh, intravascular ultrasound. So to summarize uh, the clinical utility, what we have learned is basically assessment of intermediate coronary lesions, 
and then left main lesions, especially osteo lesions, and then assessment of serial stenosis within a single coronary artery. We also had seen some data with bi bypass grafting, bifurcation lesions, and then guidance for uh, some of the bed preparation of angioplasty, where the calcification and how the arteries are prepared, guidance for stenting, what size stent we take, and assessment of restenosis, how this uh, imaging helped. I didn't show examples of CTO for sake of time, but again, they, it also gives us some understanding how to cross with these different type of wires. And identification of vulnerable plaque and prevention of future events is what we also tend to uh, aspire, though it is not very clear in all the patients uh, with imaging. So this is about uh, uh, basics of uh, IVAS imaging reporting and what we want. I will show some uh, examples of each uh, still pictures because the moving pictures will take a lot of time. So, and then go on to OCT later. If you see thrombus versus calcification and you see this uh, lesions plaque morphology there, the second, when I, uh, when I press it, you get uh, the answers for it. Initially, I thought it should be interactive, but uh, it, that uh, technology is not allowing that. I said, I'll show it myself. If you see this, uh, the image for interpretation, you have uh, dissections, fibrous plaque dissection extending into intima, and uh, various uh, modalities of dissection, where to address. And the dissection is more deep and uh, more circumferential. Probably we need to take the help of uh, another stent and patch it up. If there are minor dissections, then probably you can leave it. Then uh, this is a harsher type of dissection fibers extending deep into the media. And you also get into hematomas in the artery, then probably you need to definitely patch them up. Uh, this is again what I've mentioned is grossly underexpanded or uh, uh, undersized stents. If you see a lot of mal opposition there, and if you dilate it well, again, you oppose them well. These are, these are the, some of the examples. And some pictures of uh, intravascular ultrasound in acute MI, though we don't use it that commonly. Plaque ruptures, which are again seen in acute uh, situations, we can also make out in this. So I think uh, with this, I will uh, stop. If uh, any questions or no, uh, I was like, we can take. Otherwise, I'll go on to uh, OCT. You can move along to the OCT and then at okay, the end of I, I will yeah. just open that slide. Give me one minute. Yeah, sure. <clears throat> Very good morning, sir. Good morning, sir. Dr. Prashamraj Garu, Dr. Dasar Dr. B.S. Raj is also there. I said, uh, yeah. good morning. Good morning, Shri Good morning, how are you, sir? Very nice to have you here, sir. Thank you. They were all there before all of us, Shri because yeah. that's what that's we right. need to learn from them. <laughs> no, they are all great teachers. Uh, today, what we are because of them. Uh, undoubtedly, in every meeting, I emphasize that one and stresses. Today, what uh, I am, whatever I am doing, little things, those are all because of the great teachings from Dr. Dasar Rao, Kusumdar, Somaral. We are all indebted to them. They are all uh, le true legends. Very kind of you to say that. Mm -hmm. see. Just uh, anybody from technical team there? No, it is there. You know, it is there. I'll just give him a minute. They are there at teams. Uh, they are doing it. Any problem in loading it? No, no. I am not. I'll do so. I mostly I will be able to manage. But give me just half a minute. Yeah, yeah. I'll just tell you. I'll just tell you. Are you able to see my slides? No. We can see you, but not this slide. Yeah, I just informed the technical person he will be in touch with you. Yeah, one minute. 
Yeah. I think now participants are 65 now. I think uh, <laughs> I got it. Yeah, okay. Fine. Now you can see, no, sir? Yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, then uh, I think uh, we, I'm having another 20 minutes. Uh, then I'll cover it up briefly for in 10, 15 minutes, and then we can have some discussion. Uh, now, after the discussion about IVAS, now we have, <laughs> I'll go on to this newer imaging modality OCT. It's not uh, new, relatively new, I would say. It uh, shows some case examples of left main and bifurcation. Uh, how this model <laughs> Then uh, compared to C, the OCT resolution is quite high compared to IWAS. That means the, even if the very narrowly placed uh, and the very tenement difference also, it can clearly make out. This has made maximum difference in endothelialization of uh, strength struts. That's what we see. All others area, the, the depth of penetration again would be less when the resolution is more. Advantage of disadvantage are mentioned here. Then the fibrous plaque and the calcific plaque again measurement had uh, OCT has some advantages, which are shown here. And then uh, different types of plaques modalities are more seen. And thin cap fibroatheroma, like uh, unstable plaques, what we are wanting to discuss, uh, detect, are all more clearer with uh, OCT. This uh, slide shows advantages and disadvantages for each of this modality. Not very relevant for youngsters. But what I would say is both are complementary. If your lab can have both, that's the best. And uh, at least uh, if you have to uh, buy one new, uh, probably it's very easy for us to learn OCT and uh, have a proper imaging of both. Then if you're taking new, you can as well take uh, OCT. Then the OCT imaging, as I said, uh, diagnostic things, advantages are lesion severity, plaque arteriation, same like most of it would be common with IVAS. I would skip through some of these. But the precision PCI technique, what we call, it exactly measures you the lesion length and diameter and uh, tells us more clearly what type of stents to be using. And then uh, it has thrown a lot of light on the follow-up assessments, especially for uh, restenosis patterns which are happening. This is some of these things that would be same like uh, IVAS, uh, diameters measurement and the length measurements, all that would be same. But I would try to make it a little simpler. This I've uh, taken it from uh, Ziad Ali and others who have... Uh, done a lot of phenomenal work in OCT. So basically, with encouraging this concept of MLD max, uh, MLD is uh, OCT imaging, morphology, what we want to image the plaque. L is the length of the lesion. D is the diameter of the lesion. Morphology, we also see uh, whether you need to take the help of these uh, bed, bed preparations and length of the stent, obviously, we would know which type of things to be taken. This is uh, what I was mentioning, MLD max, what is mentioned, morphology, length, and diameter. Post PCI, we'll take the help of whether the dissections, apposition, and expansion of the stent. Uh, we need to know this uh, terminology and accordingly do it. Regarding the acquisition modality, it's very important for us to acquire image as well. If you don't uh, do the procedure right, and obviously pictures won't come well, so interpretation also suffers. So for regarding this uh, imaging modality, they say these four Ps are important, like position of the catheter. Obviously, you'll take the catheter distal to the lesion. Purge the catheter lumen, there should not be any air. Puff it uh, to see the clearance and the pullback acquisition. That's what you need to do, the four piece. Uh, this, I will show you an example here. If you see it here, this is the OCT catheter, which goes again the same wire of PCI. And see that another should excuse me because uh, for the sake of everybody, I thought I would show some of these basics too. And uh, that's how the catheter goes in and uh, gra gradually imaging happens. You can have a, a low resolution, large pullback and high resolution, uh, more uh, closer pullbacks. And then you see uh, extent of the plaque in this, uh, this thing. One thing again, which is made, the technology has made it very easy is this angio core registration. Uh, you need to have this installed in the labs, uh, but companies will help us and do it. So basically you see that you get an angio picture here. You also get a corresponding OCT picture here. So this, I don't know whether you're able to make out the thin, smaller slide, but this white structure which moves on the angiogram tells you which part of the OCT which you're uh, seeing it here. Suppose you get a branch here, it will be at the branch here. So exactly if you have an ambiguity there, you can take it, freeze it, and uh, see that particular point on the OCT. So and exactly from me measurement lengths also, from which point to which point, if you have an idea, same things you can also see in the uh, OCT. So that's how the core registration helps us to identify things uh, very easily and uh, tells us uh, to see more detail. 
So the same thing which I have shown for IVAS, now it applies more for OCT in the histology, morphology of plaques, you see it. You see it a little more clearly here, the intima, media, and adventitia, uh, which, you, which is very clear. So normally people will measure from intima to intima in IVAS, but here this comes more closer, clear. What people are recommending now is to probably you can measure from outer uh, this thing, EEL to EEL, and then probably you can slightly quarter undersize. If you are taking intima to intima, probably you can size it by a quarter size more. Then the plaque morphology, again, it has got a lot of importance because cal identifying the calcifix uh, plaques, lipid-rich plaques, and white thrombus, red thrombus. I'm not going into details of all this because of sake of time, but all this, we can get it very clearly. Uh, just to have an idea of uh, what type of plaques look like what in OCT, this is the fibrotic plaque, which you see it here, the lipidemic plaques, and the calcium, moderate calcium, you see it. And if you severe calcification, uh, you see it uh, in more detail. And the advantage of this is depth of it is also you can calculate in this. And the same uh, principles hold good even here. If the calcium is more concentric all around 360 degrees and the depth is more, you need to prepare that with the more better uh, preparations like rotoblation or the deeper catheterist calcification. Now people are recommending to use uh, IVL balloon, uh, lithotripsy balloon, what we get. So these are the things of if stents, uh, if a calcium is not cracked, uh, if you put a stent within it, it will have grossly underexpanded stents. That's why it's very important for us to uh, prepare the bed well. So if the thickness of uh, calcium uh, is 0.5 mm, length, again, extent of a longitudinal extent is more than 5 mm, and more than 50% of vessel arc, you definitely need to predilate and prepare the bed well. That's what is the thing. This I have already mentioned. You measure the diameter and area in the distal segment and the proximal segment, and you decide the type of stent and type of uh, balloon you take it. Then uh, if you have uh, this, this sort of things, deep inside also you make out the intramural hematomas behind, all that dissections, how it is seen very clearly. Uh, if it is a very minimal dissection like this, and uh, not very extending more than one quadrant. And then this sort of things, you can leave it uh, and patient do all right. But if the dissection is more uh, like this, extending more than one quadrant and penetrates deep into and leading to hematoma, then probably then you need to address this by patching it up with another stent. So that sort of thing. And their great cl clarity of imaging is again showing the stent struts and opposition. That's where I think uh, the maximum uh, benefit for the patient is happening. And if a lot of things are uh, left out like this, then it tends to get into trouble. We need to post dilate such malar positions and uh, do it well. Another thing which uh, the st stent rendering softwares give is it shows exactly from where to where the stent is extending. It also codes with color if it is grossly malar post. And if you see the extent of diameter of expansion here to here, that means this portion is underexpanded. We don't want too much of under expansion. You accept it if it is more than 90% expanded compared to a normal segment. But if it is less than 80% expanded, then probably we tend to dilate it more. That is what is the concept of expansion. If you see it, that's what I mentioned, morphology, exactly what is the uh, plaque morphology inside, how much is the plaque calcium extent, and length of it and the diameter of it we make out. And then post PCA, we see the apposition of the stent struts and whether expansion is there correctly or dissection whether minor dissections or major dissections are there. So we need to we make out those by the OCT. As we mentioned here, the areas are slightly less with IVAS, but OCT. But what we know, the standard 5, 6, 7, 8, which was mentioned in Kang et al. before, now are modified slightly. This was for a smaller body surface area patients. Now what we tend to achieve is a little more than 1 mm more than that, probably 6, 7, 8, and 10. If the left main, you get into area of more than 10, you need to have very good results and follow up. Same thing, LED, you get area of more than seven, LCX more than six, uh, you tend to do, patient do well and follow. up. So I thought I'd show one or two case examples, such sort of very critical left main stenosis. Uh, we did live transmission to TCT recently, and then uh, see that uh, later on, we think how did we select this case? Fortunately, everything went well. There's a very critical nature of the disease that, uh, again, OCT guided left main, intervention that's what we showed there and uh, rca was having some mild disease okay uh, we crossed it for the sake of time i'll run it a little faster and then uh, there's some difficulty in crossing the led we could do it the lesion is so tight you can't uh, take the oct catheter straight away we dilate with a smaller uh, undersized balloon and then take the oct imaging the 
that is the oct catheter which goes through it and then you get uh, such sort of images imaging starts this is the point of tightest stenosis what we have uh, seen in the angiogram i have taken still pictures to save time and then the other important thing we need to see is that whenever you have such critical stenosis what is the status of lcx uh, lcx ostium look a little tree even in this led run through then that's the proximal left main measurements uh, to see what is the normal value of the left main so and after that imaging we, we to make it more sure the panel also suggested imaging directly to do it in lcx then we imaged uh, the lcx also uh, with oct catheter then we got the picture there that's where the exact bifurcation uh, looks like and then uh, we decided because the lcx look free from ostium look free from disease we planned for a crossover stenting then uh, we positioned it right if the ostium is not involved we thought we can leave ostium of left main and positioned the stent expanded it and uh, that's an angiographic picture we get after stent expansion there was some suspicion of plaque shift into the lcx then that is a pro proximal part uh, part dilatation with the bigger sized balloon they look like a shelf like thing there at uh, this uh, ostium of lcx but uh, flow patterns were quite good then we again imaged post procedure we see the 3d stent rendering it looks it exactly shows it very clearly from uh, how the stent has expanded this fly through fly uh, view inside uh, how it was there in endoscopy this is another bifurcation view of this advantage of lcx ostium how clearly you could see the circular ostium but there are struts on it now the recommendation that we became wiser you need to do, do at least uh, smaller dilatations to make it uh, start free of those things then again uh, we had crossed it we did a, a final uh, post dilatation and uh, we felt that uh, the, as it is shown well in the ostium and people said we have to document it further we did this is the final result in angio it looked quite well and then uh, we felt that uh, we should also cross check by doing ffr ffr baseline in the lcx was 0.97 and later on 0.88 so nothing was done for lcx and the patient did well the whole procedure was finished there is another multi vessel disease this is not relevant for our talk and this another two stent approach also it helps for us uh, to plan the procedure well this is another patient of a very critical stenosis of uh, left main what we had and uh, this is a bioprosthetic valve which degenerated this patient again later had uh, actually came for tower when work up we also had a coronary disease that's the tight eccentric nature of stenosis uh, for sake of time i would rush through initial pre dilatations then again uh, lcx stenting that's a final uh, kiss dk crush was followed here then the led stent that the first uh, deployment this stent was taken and deployed then uh, it was rewired that is the second kiss that is the final result so this patient also did well and the later on uh, we waited for this is a post dilatation part and now people say it is mandatory to do part after the final kiss we did the oct again demonstrated everything uh, i'll show you the oct pictures that is the relevance of talk today the led to left main uh, here i'll show you some freeze pictures at the distal part of the stent of led you need to see whether there's no dissections there and our position is good there in the led and the lcx ostium again it was uh, free and then we could see that struts are extending very well there's no area of uh, miss miss missed at the ostium obviously when you use two stents less likely to have the final mld which we got is 12.6 uh, more than 10 would have good on for good follow up results and then uh, this is the proximal portion of left main again which is free from dissection after 6 weeks uh, we did tower to the patient and then we came for follow up recently on teleconsultation he is doing all right so this is about a word about uh, bifurcation disease again basically it helps us to plan and see the plaque morphology and if which side of the plaque is there that probably it will give an idea of the narrow angle if it is there then more chance of side branch occlusion for sake of time i can't go into details i think i'm left with 5 minutes we'll uh, have some it's a narrow angle and then uh, more of plaque then less likely to close then also some uh, things about uh, which struts to cross a lot of youngsters have doubts in distal crossing proximal crossing i thought would explain in little more detail 
but probably if somebody is interested we can have it in discussion this is what i mentioned that if you have struts across in the uh, osteal branch then you have more chance of getting to trouble that's why you dilate and uh, clear the struts uh, with the balloon dilatations this is what the struts are like this then you get after kissing you open it up and that uh, side branch osteum will be free from struts that sort of things are quite unimaginable before such clarity which he gives these are all real pictures which we obtained in the lab see this uh, if a struts are left this i borrowed it for somebody the struts are left here then the patients could uh, develop restenosis at that particular point uh, it also tells us clearly sometimes if you miss the osteum then uh, that part of thing will not be covered so all these uh, things will be very shown very clearly this is uh, again through inside the uh, fly through mode of side branch osteums uh, whether how it is how they are covered and whether the osteum it is clear this is again a live pictures you get it through the software so bifurcation mode you can rotate uh, the pictures and see and uh, that's the clarity and uh, strength of imaging you get and uh, you see it in longitudinal way and cross sectional way and that's how we are a lot of studies have come up so basically uh, oct in bifurcation tells us assess the main vessel side branch current and angle pot dilatation and uh, how to cross it distally i couldn't cover it in detail for this but basically again uh, if you are doing a more of provisional type of stenting you do distal crossing otherwise a uh, proximal stent crossing and try to get a good uh, uh, bifurcation results too all these are possible and uh, with this newer type of imaging thank you all and i think uh, i was very happy to share this recent concluded ecct we had more than 3500 cardios logged in we try to give as much live uh, pictures as possible dr martelly and others were there huge numbers of logins were there every day if this almost looked like a live live pictures presentation i was also very happy and uh, another uh, new platform because a lot of teachers of mine are there what we thought we do from facts is clinical skills and exam guidance by super specialists this is the new platform which are designing for next month where super specialists teach Uh, undergraduates and postgraduates and uh, tell about the clinical skills a lot of students this idea came from request from medical students my daughter is in final year they are not able to attend clinical postings we thought some of this will be compensating by super specialist teaching in their respective areas to the undergraduates and postgraduates thank you very much for patient hearing if you have any questions i would be happy to take it thank you srinivas uh, i just want to ask you one question if you have to choose only one intravascular imaging for ct versus ivs which one would you choose keeping uh, the the spectrum of diseases what you see coronary artery disease but for the osteal uh, left main uh, which imaging which is slightly challenging though there are some techniques to image osteum of left main also with oct and a uh, lot of advantages are there with oct imaging compared to ivs so if somebody is learning new or uh, somebody wants to see clearly and, uh, and adapt the technology very well i feel uh, you can uh, if you have to purchase only one then probably you can yeah. purchase oct imaging which has advantages lot more than the intravascular ultrasound but if only a place where it suffers is the osteal uh, locations and uh, yeah. some of these things uh, so i think uh, uh, if you are to learn it new and then probably you should buy oct but somebody who had a lot of experience mm. with ivs before there are some newer modifications coming up with ivs with uh, better penetration catheters uh, and better megahertz catheters also that you can upgrade if you already have a ivs machine in your lab you can upgrade it if you have to buy new i, I feel we should uh, uh, buy a oct and now ivs is going up to 60 megahertz yeah that's what i said yeah. if we have it then but still we have i have seen i couldn't show it other talk other uh, case example i had in one of the multi vessel patient who was referred from ranchi we did both in that patient and then there are definite advantages i feel uh, which are very clearly demonstrated with oct <laughs> any chat uh, other thing with this krishnan was sir and uh, somra sir were discussing there there is a provision for people to chat questions sir in this Hey, is there it is take there a question from chat suppose somebody is doing it because physically they may not be able to answer the questions and raise the, they can type it in chat and then uh, we can actually hey. answer those questions sir, uh, one question in chat box sir how to differentiate malposition and under expansion yeah but that is uh, i i to rush it a little malposition is basically when there is a gap 
between the stent struts and the artery uh, wall. Okay, so that is what is molar position. Under expansion is, you see the stent is opposed well at that particular point also. But if you see if you see the longitudinal extent of the vessel, where the vessel is normal, that is almost uh, expanded well. That longitudinal picture I shown you there. Uh, that if you see it, suppose you see the area which you got a 10, 10 uh, in a normal expanded area, even a slightly narrowed place, suppose there's a plaque, it's not mm -hmm. expanded very well, calcium, there you get about 9 mm, that is 10% uh, is still acceptable. But if it's more than le less than 20%, then people say that re people could have higher events and follow up. So expansion is basically compared to the normal segment, how much this place uh, stent you got area there. That's where is the expansion. Mala position is within the particular lumen, how is the stent opposing to that wall? Suppose there's a more gap, more than 5 mm, then it is not supposed to be good and you need to expand it to the balloon. So this is basically a difference at one particular point to comparing with the normal segment. So under expansion is when you compare with the normal segments, how much is that stented segment you obtain the diameter. Suppose you got an area of 10 in the normal segment, you also got area of 10 in the stented segment, that is a perfectly expanded stent. Whereas if it is the opposition, mal opposition is inside uh, the, how the stent struts are attaching to the vessel wall. That is where it, uh, this difference. And mal opposition is no good at all. You can't accept more than 5 mm space in the stent struts and the wall because of its high thrombosis. You need to post dilate. Whereas under expansion, you can have accept up to 20% under expansion, still it is okay. Because in spite of doing our best efforts with high pressure balloon dilatation, NC balloons and all, sometimes you have mild residual narrowings, uh, about 10, 20% maximum is acceptable. Again, it's less than 80%. Uh, again, you need to expand it further also there. That's the difference between uh, mala position versus expansion. Rajesh, I'll put it in one sentence. You can have a well-opposed uh, stent but still under expanded. Yes. So the under expansion is with respect to the expected size of the vessel, expected size of the stent with respect to the size of the vessel. Normal segment where you have- the Normal the segment. segment. Yeah. Same there is one question in the chat box. It says, are there any contraindications for usage of this intravascular imaging? The contraindications per se for intravascular ultrasound uh, I, I can think that there's no particular contraindication unless you're not able to do it uh, yourself. The second thing is uh, for OCT, there's a challenge because whenever you have in the very high creatinine values in these patients, then you are need to use uh, some contrast also to get images. That's where the OCT, you can think it as a relative contraindication with patient. But patient is already on dialysis. Again, there's no problem. We do it. Nowadays, newer modalities of contrast uh, materials mm -hmm. are uh, coming like Dextron, we started using one thing uh, which comes with a Braun company, Tetraspan. Those are relatively safer, uh, but we need to have more data on it. Those are relative contraindication for OCT is very high creatinine levels, this patient. Sir, one more question, sir, from the chat box. From left, for left main, which is preferred, sir, IVAS or OCT? That's what I was covering up on. Left main, body and bifurcation, I feel OCT is good enough to use it. If it is osteum left main, uh, unless you are very comfortable to tackle how to use OCT in the osteal vessels, there are some techniques to do it. Otherwise, I was scores over uh, imaging the osteum of the left main over OCT. There's one question in the chat box which says, um, what are the materials that you use to have blood-free medium? Which I already said anyway, but can just repeat it for the sake of the candidate. It is actually the question of, oh, uh, I had that uh, uh, picture, but for sake of time, I didn't do it. It's a question of how do you engage the catheter? Ostium, the catheter should get, guide catheter should go deep into the ostium, not too deep, but it should be just approximate in the ostium so that when you inject the contrast, it should be filling the vessel well. So if, they, if you don't fill it well, then obviously you get a blood artifacts. So that's why that four piece, what we mentioned, is the first you see how is the guide located and the first you give puff then again do uh, clearance of the air and other things and then you pull it back so if you engage the catheter well and then probably there should be good coordination with the technician and the point where we inject though machine suggests when to inject uh, so that the particular point you need to inject so that once the contrast uh, once the uh, the light source senses the contrast it starts imaging 
so that's how it is if you don't engage the catheter well and then you get the blood also going into you get lot of artifacts it looks like a clot there so if you engage the catheter well that's how in live demonstrations uh, sridhar would agree we'd always get better pictures than than the, the real world scenario because in real world you are not very careful of doing it but actually speaking you need to follow those same precautions engage the catheter well and puff the catheter then probably see the lumen wash out with this catheter and then take a picture that pressure also very important another important thing is uh, one minute sri the nitroglycerin giving prior is also important otherwise this vessels going to spasm so before we take a picture give intracoronary nitroglycerin also and then start imaging uh, sri the actually uh, when you are giving manual injection you have to have a continuous and persistent pressure when you inject in between some people relax so that lead to artifacts more and because the blood the infrared rays will not travel through the blood because the rbc it will not cross so because that it has to be blood free column so you may try the contrast you may try the even dextron and as he said you can give the saline but the dextron problem again renal injury so because that uh, now they have withdrawn they are trying with the saline and contrast also we observed when you go with high con like ionic or non ionic But that also it makes difference. More ionic contrast will be more clearance. But uh, the but overall the contrast acquisition is very good. That is ideal. And regarding the uh, doc the acid or acid one, which one uh, beginner should choose? Though learning curve is uh, very difficult with IVS compared to OCT. But I feel the the spectrum of cases mm. we can cover compared to OCT IVS is far superior. Why? Because LB dysfunction. hemodynamically unstable and severe LB, uh, renal dysfunction all these patients you can do even uh, os ctvo is there retrograde like a subintermal crossing all these are possible with ivs rather than oct the oct definitely in some aspects definitely far superior compared to the ivs particularly when you see the endothelial where thin cap fibroatrema is there like a spotty calcification macrophages all these things so, even isr etls you can identify very clearly so these are all advantage but each technique has its own advantages and disadvantages but if you want to have only one uh, device i think ivs is it can cover all the uh, modalities compared to the oct the only problem is you should be comfortable with ivs imaging interpretation yeah that's what okay. that uh, learning curve so should be there learning curve is there uh, it's not slightly if you put in efforts you can learn that also yeah. no problem learning curve is long Yeah, ten ten, sir. Now we can yeah. go on to the next question. Thank you, Sinvas Kumar. Thank you, sir. Sir, Dr. Somaraz wants to say something, sir. Sir, Sinvas Kumar, can you say something? The discussion is over. Yeah, sir, yeah. Sir, please, sir. Thanks for uh, watching it, sir. Um, it's a pleasure. Uh, sir, it's a pleasure to so see you, sir. I, I, uh, thank you. So I must uh, tell you, I uh, I am a devil's advocate. <laughs> In the sense, number one. Uh, let us look at any new technology we had. Uh, Dr. Krishna Raju and uh, people like him will tell us uh, how how well we use echocardiography after uh, so many advances and all that in the real world of use. How much well echocardiography is used and decisions made by an average cardiologist? Number one. Number two. We have uh, originally balloon angioplasty and now stenting, and both of them are. Uh, Less uh, invasive than uh, surgeries, and all of us are happy about it. We claimed even without all these devices, we claimed excellent results over surgeries, and we said surgeries were finished. Then we say we have all this information now. Do you need all this information in all these patients we do for angioplasty and stenting? And uh, isn't it too much and unnecessary information? Number one. Information is unusable, and uh, and our reaction to it is common. And uh, when everybody starts using, and every patient is going to be like anything else, not only the cost but also complications and all that. Suppose we have, I would say, uh, an angioplasty, uh, say uh, a stent, is a brutal technique, employed deployed under high pressure. Even with the perfect stenting, you still have restenosis. We still have uh, uh, sudden uh, occlusions. With all that, what do you do with all this information? As somebody said, 
atherosclerosis is an arterial disease and uh, acute myocardial infarction is a blood vessel um, blood disease then having said that uh, suppose you have a beautiful woman bearing hair will she look more beautiful dissecting hair will look more beautiful what do you do with that to me these technologies are uh, overdone and overused unless we <laughs> put it in perspective and say that everybody has to do and every patient has to have it will be misleading thank you no no it's never advocated in every patient sir type a type of lesions and all it's not advocated but when you're tackling left main and complex cases multivessel disease calcific disease we need to give optimal results to compete with surgeons that's where i think uh, this technology is useful not to be done in every patient i've shown the data in the country 4% of patients only it is being used maybe in the best of the centers also it will be used in about 10 20% but it depends upon the type of case which you are doing if you are doing a left vein or if you are doing a very calcific disease which is long segment where you need multiple stents that's where this technology gives us and when you are competing with surgeons you should do your best job uh, to give positive outcomes to the patient that's where it matters not for all patients sir actually the adapt da study has shown very clearly they have categorized like a simple lesions bifurcation triple oil disease diffuse long lesions they have found more at uh, the better outcomes with a complex disease that's the reason the cost effectiveness the i was more superior if the patient is having a bifurcation left main like a triple oil disease diffuse long lesion these patients require a more optimization and correct the best predictors like a tissue prolapse and tissue dissection under expansion which are not seen on routine angiography that's the reason if the disease if the uh, the procedure is more complex the usefulness of the i was becomes important role and optimizing definitely may stress will become less particularly in senior and shrinivas kumar particularly in cto particularly in cto's it is mandatory to have this yeah uh, and uh, particularly if so retrograde technique cto's cannot be done without ivs so certain the subset of patient definitely need thank you satyamurthy uh, thank you sridhar and uh, dr shrinivas kumar for uh, Active interaction and uh, I'll now request uh, Dr. Sridhar to present, uh, asking his resident to present the case. Mm -hmm. Examiners will be Dr. B. S. Raju, Dr. Krishnam Raju, and Satya Murthy, and of course uh, Sridhar. Dr. Dr. Sridhar, after ten forty-five, I have to participate in another meeting. I'll just be there for some time. Okay. Sure, sure, please. Yeah, Sridhar. Yeah, I'm asking him. I think. Sure. Rakesh, you can present. Sure. Oh, yes, sir. Rakesh is a DNB uh, finally a student. So we have the respected teachers and my dear colleagues. Today I am presenting a case of uh, 46-year-old uh, female, uh, Miss K. Subhuna, homemaker, middle socio-economic class. Residing at Manchiral, presented uh, in emergency department at Sunshine Hospital with the complaints of. Chest pain since six days, shortness of breath since five days. Uh, my patient was uh, asymptomatic six days back. Then she developed recurrent episodes of chest pain and SOB since uh, six days. Uh, coming to chest pain, uh, patient complained of uh, sudden onset chest pain on seventh August at four a four p.m. while she was doing routine house. Uh, the pain was substernal in location. It was burning in sensation. radiating to left arm increased on exertion and relieved by rest after 10 minutes uh, she had no, it, it was not associated with shortness of breath palpitation sweating and rest of the day she did not uh, complain of any other pain episode next day uh, uh, at around 7:30 am while she was cooking she uh, she got sudden onset severe chest pain which lasted for 30 minutes which was substernal wheezing type more severe uh, than previous episode it was diffusely localized over uh, uh, precordial region radiated to left shoulder and arm it was uh, relieved by sublingual nitrate and pain was associated with shortness of breath uh, restlessness agitation and profuse sweating mm. shortness of breath uh, it was associated with chest pain and patient complained of sudden onset uh, rapidly progressive uh, shortness of breath from ia class 2 to class 4 uh, patient uh, as soon as she got just uh, shortness of breath her husband and uh, son took her to the bed 
uh, and uh, uh, asked her to lie down uh, uh, and take rest but she was not uh, comfortable sleeping and uh, she uh, she she uh, she felt comfortable in sitting position in head slanging down and it was associated with chest pain uh, restlessness profuse sweating uh, immediately she was taken to karimnagar hospital where she got evaluated and uh, uh, after giving some iv injections and oxygen therapy her shortness of breath relieved so patient referred uh, here for further evaluation and management at arrival uh, in er at 6 uh, 6 pm uh, in on 9th august patient has no chest pain no sop with only mild sweating and anxiety so during hospital uh, stay patient was mostly confined in bed in semi recumbent position with minimal exertion uh, she underwent uh, routine uh, hrct and covid 19 has a protocol and uh, after that uh, she underwent uh, after uh, covid report she underwent angio on tubal uh, post procedure patient complaint of uh, sob uh, in recumbent position and patient shifted to intensive care unit after uh, medication patient relieved of sop uh, there is no issue of palpitation syncope pre syncope edema fever cough expectoration uh, epigastric or abdominal pain claudication pain in extremities motor loss sensor loss or altered speech or loss of consciousness okay kishnamaraj garu yeah i'm yeah. listening yeah yeah yeah, yeah. i think uh, as I, as we discussed in the morning um, i think each of the consultant to the faculty will examine the patient by rotation rather than simultaneously so you can start yeah, yeah. that's yeah you can start up with the, okay. the, your interaction with the student followed by okay. dr b s raju followed by uh, dr satyamurthy and finally dr sridhar okay yeah uh, i mean doctor uh, what are the key points in the history sir i have completed present history only and past history personal history i have not yet uh, told sir uh, in cover, uh, in history cover, in history cover, cover the history completely before completely okay, okay. Yeah. past history patient is uh, uh, a known case of diabetes mellitus type 2 since 6 years and hypertension since 4 years for which she is taking regular medication which are under control and regular follow up around one year back she was diagnosed uh, uh, as di- dyslipidemia and routine evaluation uh, but she continued medication only for 3 months then sh- uh, then she stopped and she did not underwent follow up evaluation there is no past history of uh, coronary artery disease rheumatic heart disease valvular uh, congenital heart disease cva peripheral artery disease uh, chronic kidney disease uh, or any major uh, surgeries and bleeding disorders personal history uh, her appetite is adequate she is non vegetarian and consumes uh, adequate uh, fruits and vegetables her bowel bladder are normal uh, sleep is normal there are no emotional or mood swings no major economic woes uh, no addictions she is most uh, post menopausal 3 uh, years ago uh, uh, before that she had regular cycles uh, two children both are normal uh, vaginal delivery and uneventful sir family history or father had a history of uh, a possible uh, cad at the age of uh, uh, around 50 years mother has a history of hypertension and diabetes no other family members has history of uh, cardiovascular di- uh, disease or sudden cardiac okay i understand so, that uh, there is a good uh, cv of the patient that is available uh, the presentation is uh, quite good in fact very elaborate but i would like to know from you what are the key points in the history to summarize uh, to summarize she is a 47 year old female with uh, recent onset uh, chest pain uh, with uh, ordinary physical activity uh, multiple episodes increasing fever, uh, frequency and severity associated with sob and uh, uh, risk factors like diabetes hypertension dyslipidemia and family history sir. so what do you deduce from that uh, although chest pain sudden onset chest pain with sob attributes to many differential diagnoses but uh, i will uh, uh, i will uh, first diagnosis uh, my first differential diagnosis would be the coronary vascular coronary artery disease uh, acute coronary syndrome with unstable angina 
and other uh, differential uh, she is a known hypertensive she can be having accelerated hypertension episode uh, with episodic uh, uh, or uh, she uh, she may have asd uh, uh, with eisenmangerization or uh, other uh, uh, acute uh, onset uh, chest pain severe chest pains like uh, acute pericarditis aortic dissection uh, and takosubu also in the end so in the rare form i think three conditions need to cross your mind one you have said it that is the priority one coronary artery disease and uh, acute coronary syndrome quite acceptable in view of the type of story and also the family background so it appears quite reasonable to think that she has an acute coronary syndrome then of course because of the hypertension etc the differential diagnosis for these conditions will be dissection of the aorta or acute pulmonary embolism so these are the three top differential diagnostic things if it is a cardiac chest pain from your the uh, differential from your uh, uh, i mean history taking and history presentation it appears that uh, it is uh, likely to be cardiac origin rather than non cardiac so these are the three from the cardiac stable which are likely to be considered very seriously not excluding any non cardiac it is possible that they could also be non cardiac like esophageal pains and pleural pains etc but i think it is quite reasonable what you have said so from that point on what are the points in favor of thinking that it is coronary not anything else Uh, it's a recent onset uh, chest pain increasing on exertion uh, and uh, increasing in fre- uh, frequency and severity uh, suggest uh, it uh, it has a uh, kind of uh, uh, classical radiation and associated with uh, sweating uh, more towards uh, coronary artery disease uh, and if, if the pain if it is a sharp uh, shooting type uh, uh in, in no no negatives no negative the question is what are the points in favor of coronary artery disease uh, sudden onset so, chest pain uh, yeah yeah i understand pain. don't uh, don't repeat for the sake of time so you have given some reasonable uh, indications now do you think anything else also may have similar kinds of pain or do you think it is an atherosclerotic coronary artery disease or non atherosclerotic coronary artery disease like scad for example that is spontaneous coronary artery dissection yes. because the age group you are talking about is the commonest age group for spontaneous coronary artery dissection as well yes yes okay then now uh, uh, how can you rule out a dissection of the aorta for example uh, this is all for discussion sake yes hypertic dissection usually it's sudden onset uh, highest incident is in the beginning itself and it's a progressive suprasternal and uh, most classically it radiates to interscapular region it is classically excruciating and tearing type of pain okay and they may also present with other things like syncope uh uh-huh. aortic uh, insufficiency uh, syncope oh, yes, but and... we haven't examined the patient as yet we are still in the history you know and then di- dissection can be related to your physical exertion or could be spontaneous right the reason why i am bringing out is the spontaneous coronary artery dissection is more common in women and it, it is more common in the sixth decade that is 50 plus years so that is the reason why i am bringing that into question and also during pregnancy of course that is out of question this your subject is a post menopausal woman so those but those three are the occasions when scad is more possible <clears throat> uh, shortness of breath also is the second leading symptom according to your story Yes. So, how do you uh, connect that symptom with your uh, coronary artery disease in this patient? Uh, ischemic uh, uh, LV dysfunction or uh, 
uh, any causes of mechanical causes like papillary muscle dysfunction or rupture or uh, uh, one a acute ischemia can be having a shortness of breath as a anginal equivalent that's one and two there may be myocardial dysfunction during ischemia three it is possible that she already had some silent infarcts or and above that there is a new ischemia producing airway dysfunction and then following on that her current situation suppose if it is an acute infarct then the mechanical complications as you have mentioned are possible like pap muscle dysfunction pleural leaf flat rupture pap or rupture septum or uh, cardiac tamponade rupture with cardiac tamponade so we need to keep those things in mind certainly so i will pass it on to next uh, panelist i think it is dr somraj bs rajgar somrajgar has he left or such a nice but actually it is very comprehensive and nice presentation mm -hmm. one of the positive things about your presentation is you brought out uh, even socio economic status and financial status and all that uh, because that is the way we are supposed to address address the person behind the disease uh, also not the disease alone uh, good thing you have done it your presentation uh, description of the symptom is typical of acute myocardial ischemia without beating around the bush but what could be the cause for it can be discussed and second thing you uh, if i if i saw you uh, you also said the coronary angiogram was done no 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 sir never sir she it's a first episode sir started six, then when she was six, shifted eight. from a peripheral ah. place here was an electrocardiogram done ah. yes sir here uh, in the hospital during hospital she underwent coronary angiogram on 12 sir you know uh, what i meant to say is when she was shifted from karimnagar no ah yes sir uh, was an electrocardiogram done there Ah uh, yes, sir. You must tell us because the, you don't have to artificially keep away information. Electrocardiogram matters, you know. Yes. Any patient who comes to us with a symptom like that, not to do an electrocardiogram immediately uh, in the first instance. First things first approach here, isn't it? So tell us yes. about electrocardiogram. Yeah, she uh, she underwent a cardiac evaluation, sir. I mentioned, but uh, not specifically ECG. Uh, Yeah, this is not important at this stage. Yes, Actually, we were fabricated. Whatever doctor has asked previously, ECG was done or not? Yes, ECG sir, done. ECG was done. Have you seen that ECG? What were the findings? And after that, what is your evaluation? Don't fabricate. And you have to present the facts. Previously, what are all the investigations were done? You have to show those investigations also. No, no, I thought it didn't. No, you have seen that ECG or not? Are, no, suppose sir. they are unable to bring ECG or not? That way, whatever you no, want. No, sir, to... I have not seen the ECG. Okay, if you have not seen the ECG, it's fine. But uh, ECG findings matter, you know. So yes. in other words, uh, the presentation is typical of acute coronary syndrome with a diabetic background, hypertension background. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the things, uh, apart from Dr. Krishnamurthy, what all he mentioned is always also keep in mind patient with diabetes. and metformin they also have uh, vitamin b12 deficiency and homocysteine elevation that predisposes them to acute coronary syndrome because it increases the tendency for thrombosis so we should keep that in mind but not in emergency but first things first approach so in other words while you may evaluate this patient looking at the electrocardiogram is fundamental it is almost as basic as a physical examination Yes, sir. Okay. I finished, sir. Yeah. Uh, I think I will pass it on to the next panelist. I think it is Dr. Satya. Satya. Yeah. Take over. Uh, there is nothing much to add. We have already covered Dr. Krishnan Raju, but there are one or two things I want to say. He mentioned in the history, aortic dissection. Uh, where is that candidate? Is uh, is uh, is this a typical type of uh, 
chest pain which gets relieved when the patient was transferred from karim nagar patient was comfortable when she came do you think that acute aortic dissection the pain will subside so soon no sir huh? it will not subside it will be uh, a progressive continuous pain will be there sir. that is one second thing if there is ascending aortic dissection ar there will be patient pulmonary edema also may not get subsided even if you give diuretic there may be temporary relief so that uh, you kept it as a second differential diagnosis that's okay but this is one of the things you have to stress upon when you are telling the history there are two things which you unnecessarily took when you were telling the possibilities of the history and the krishnamraj as you told two differential diagnosis one you said trocosubo uh, syndrome trocosubo because this is a diagnosis of exclusion of angiogram this is not a primary clinical diagnosis so you should not mention immediately examiners will pounce on you without doing angio you can't tell about it number 1 Number two, in the history, you said one of the possibilities large AST developing uh, because of large AST Eisenmenger. First of all, Eisenmenger won't present with severe chest pain like this acute coronary syndrome and pulmonary edema. Onset of pulmonary edema rules out the possibility of a large uh, rules out the possibility of an ASD. When there is a large ASD, left atrium is decompensated right atrium, so there is no pulmonary edema there. So this is not the way Eisenmenger. Unless sir, you brought two different diagnoses after the history, so you have to be very careful when you are telling. So first, as coronary artery disease is right, then aortic dissection you can tell, but you can always tell in the history that because the patient was comfortable when she shifted, unlikely or very less likely to be aortic dissection. Yes, one comment I would like to add to such as. One is that he also mentioned in the past history, no history of uh, any congenital heart disease. Yes, yes. But considering yes. it, uh, then two, uh, I just want to add to what the comment which Sachin made. The ASD, PAH, with or without Eisenmenger, is known to produce extrinsic obstruction to the left main coronary artery. leading on to either syncope or sudden cardiac death or acute mi or exertional angina so we ourselves have seen probably about 8 to 9 patients who had an assessment asd the uh, asd severe pah large main pulmonary artery compressing the left main coronary artery producing the ischemic uh, syndromes so that is something which i would like to add uh, but the overall picture of this patient does not uh, go anywhere near asd so there was no need to keep eisenmenger asd as uh, a particular condition for different diagnosis uh, i think uh, sachcha if you have finished we'll move on to next yeah, i am finished i am through no no i just I want to uh, raju i just want to ask the candidate one or two questions uh, before we pass it on to dr sridhar uh, i would like to know how reliable is the history in females regarding the relevance of the history to the diagnosis of coronary artery disease uh, in female uh, uh, it is uh, uh, less so, uh, relevant than males sir uh, usually females uh, complaint uh, of atypical pains so <clears throat> uh, agreed that the patient you know i think you have to proceed with the probability analysis what we call bayesian approach of the, to the disease a 60 year old female who is diabetic hypertensive and a family history of coronary artery disease it makes the coronary artery disease as the first thing second yes, one of the point sorry go and go ahead sir i'll uh, yeah. after you yeah sure one of the points about the drug history is uh, although dr uh, b s raju mentioned about metformin and homocysteine uh, there is some new data regarding the usage of the drugs and occurrence of uh, uh, connective tissue disorders including spontaneous dissection is usage of this uh, four amino quinolines like cipron and the uh, group uh, the long term usage and recurrent usage has resulted in uh, what do you call structural changes in the collagen it is inclusive both in achilles tendon as also in the aortic and uh, there is some data now to show 
that uh, there is a higher incidence of dissecting aneurysms of aorta in people who take these quinolones. This is only a preliminary observation. So uh, you, you need to ask about the drug history completely in all these patients. Third thing is, you said uh, the pain subs, uh, the pain or the patient became worse on lying down, the pain discomfort. Why do you think is the cause? What is the physiological basis of worsening of the pain? Uh, it is ischemic pain. Mainly myocardial oxygen uh, uh, is uh, determined by heart rate, BP, uh, contractility, and uh, uh, wall stress, sir. Uh, most probably uh, in wall stress, lapless law, uh, wall stress is directly proportional to LV cavity size and indirectly proportional to thickness. So when a patient sits and uh, hangs or uh, uh, legs down, then uh, LV cavity will decrease in size. So that's why uh, wall stress will decrease and probably she... And what about preload? What happens to preload in lying down position? What happens to preload in sitting decreases. position? Before yeah, he pre preload increases, I, want him, uh, I wanted to ask him something. Uh, continuing on what Dr. Dasagar said about the reliability of pain and other things in a lady, uh, can you tell us something about the gender bias in diagnosis and management of coronary artery disease? I know uh, the prevalence is. Uh, uh, No, no, he is asking gender bias, yes, yes. both in terms of uh, diagnosis, refer yes. for further investigation. Yes, the symptoms over presentation of symptoms. Women versus men. You are aware of it or not aware of it, doctor? No, sir. Yeah, let us not waste time. I think. Yeah. Uh, Carry on. Yeah. And I just also wanted to add something. When uh, continuing on what Dr. Krishnamuraju says, and Dr. Dasagar said, uh, posture, uh, it, is, it may suggest uh, right ventricular angina or right coronary occlusion, but uh, relief uh, promptly with nitroglycerin is not a feature of right, right coronary occlusion again. So you have to keep that in mind. Okay. The pericardial pain also is uh, relieved on sitting and more in the lying down position. So that is one thing which you need to keep in mind because you brought in pericarditis also as a, a one among the differential diagnosis after the first three. Second comment I want to make is there is a completely independent entity now which is very vast, large numbers, angina with normal coronary arteries. Monica, Monica. Monica. Angina with normal coronary arteries is a puzzle is a very difficult, clinically speaking, difficult to diagnose, difficult to treat. Uh, I, prognostically also, we are not sure how it progresses. So some of these issues are brought out uh, by that uh, angina with normal coronary arteries, which is more common in, in women. women. In women, more common in women. So much so that it continues to be a long-standing disability without any appropriate treatment for these patients. In diabetics, the coronary arteries may be normal, but they may have endothelial dysfunction and may present as a typical angina. That is another comment which I would like to add. Can we move on to uh, Dr. Sridhar? Yeah. Uh, what is the importance of risk factors? We have a very nice history, but hypertension is there, diabetes is there, dyslipidemia. Three strong risk factors are there. Female patients, risk factors, that itself indicates why you are not uh, correlated that one, because the coronary artery disease, when uh, then Dr. Krishnan Raj is asking, the more number of risk factors there, risk is more for coronary artery disease. That you have to highlight. The other thing, the Unnecessarily, you put the diagnosis of congenital <coughs> RDC, that uh, uh, SMGR syndrome, past history, a lot of uh, disparity. And uh, Dr. Subhu should not be. I personally feel it should not be because it's based upon the symptoms. And uh, that uh, can you make a diagnosis of uh, MI based upon the history, Rakesh? Uh, no, sir. No. Why? Uh, because it requires. Uh... Uh, blood enzymes and uh, evidence of uh, myocardial necrosis, uh, troponins and ECG. 
ECG, those things are ACS. So this, uh, the pericardial, uh, pericardial spine, how will you differentiate? One is sitting and bending forward and with breath, with breath deep movements. Deep that deep should deep be there. So okay, usually deep it deep is related by sitting and bending forward and usually related to the respiratory, stabbing type more of, not like a more of burning type. And the pericardial pain radiates very typically to the left trapezius yeah. upper border. Yeah. Upper border of the trapezius on the left side. That is very, very typical for pericardial pain. Uh, okay. Just add to any other, any other clinical saying, there, uh, a female patient have, in Indian circumstances, Rakesh? Sir? Any uh, this type of presentation uh, will it present in, in particularly in uh, geographic area of India, Indian subcontinent? Any Takayasu you can think, the Takayasu can it present with uh, uh, ACS type of presentation, female patient, because you have not examined the purple pulses, uh, female patient presenting with uh, acute ACS type of presentation. Yes, sir. Uh, the, it can be Takayasu. Can present. Uh, you should think of the certain possibility, like aortic dissection, continuous excreting pain, most of the like continuous, and they may have a CBA type of problem. They may have a, if it is extending to the limb, limbic ischemia, if it is extended to the renal, other parameters you think when you discuss, but don't bring, which are unim unimportant, like a, a uh, hypertension. One, uh, at one time, you said there is no congenital uh, history of congenital heart disease. Another time, you are telling that uh, P -A S M Menger syndrome, which is not correlating. There is no past history. So when you present the case, always you sit and relax, you sit and think properly before linking each other, before evaluate. Okay, I think, sir, you can proceed. Yeah, I think we should proceed now to the physical examination. Can Is Sinos Kumar not there for this case? Sinos Kumar has left apparently. Okay. Uh, um, so you can do yes, the sir, physical there, but I thought others are discussing. I'll just listen. Yeah. Okay. No, no, no. You can, you should participate. No, it's okay, Sinos. sir. More people again ah. interfere in the discussion. Yeah. No, okay. it's fine. It is over to you. Yeah. So what comments you would like to make <laughs> uh, with the background of this history? No, no, as, as registered as by Sridhar already, more relevant things uh, should discuss rather than congenital heart disease and all that, I thought. Same thing Sridhar told. Coronary heart disease, actually typical history is very typical, suggesting it's almost uh, like a CAD. But uh, to get in some of the other things which are relevant to this is okay. But by routine, I think students are taught by all seniors that you should get all the differential diagnosis and congenital heart disease and all that also you're bringing in. But it's up to you. Like, yeah, they should not be blind to other causes. But what is there in front of the, this patient is a typical host for a coronary artery disease. So everything going wrong for her, family, <laughs> diabetes, hypertension, post menopausal age, so on and so forth. So I think there is no need to bring in uh, some esoteric things into yeah. different. It does not mean it could be one of them. So you should not be totally blind, but you need to be also pragmatic. Okay. I think we'll move on. We'll move on and uh, we'll ask the candidate to present the physical examination. Mm -hmm. Yes. On examination, patient is conscious, cooperative, well-oriented to time, place, and person, and she is well-built and well-nourished. Her height is 158 centimeters. Upper body segment is 81 centimeters. Lower body segment is 77 segment centimeters. Weight is 72 kg. BMI is 28.84 kg per meter square. Arm span is 144, uh, 154 centimeters. Waist circumference is 102 centimeters. Uh, she is having pallor, no icterus, clubbing, cyanosis. Edema, lymphadenopathy, no uh, goitrous swelling in the neck. Uh, there is no transverse earlobe uh, crease, uh, no xanthalisma, no tendon, tendon or palmar xanthomas. Sorry, no. can I interrupt here, uh, Dr. Dasagar? See, there is what is called clinical priority. First things, first approach. The patient who is presenting like this, the first requirement is, apart from vital signs, you must uh, look at the electrocardiogram. And... Uh, Family history and all those things come only later. Mm -hmm. So, electrocardiogram is fundamental. That is called clinical priority. Okay. 
డాక్టర్ సోమరాజ్ గారు హలో హలో సోమరాజ్ గారు ఇన్ ది ఇన్ ది ఎగ్జామ్ దే విల్ ఎక్స్పెక్ట్ హిమ్ టు గివ్ ఎ క్లినికల్ డయాగ్నోస్ బిఫోర్ దే గివ్ ది ఈసీజీ వాట్ వి డూ వాట్ వి డూ ఇన్ ది క్లినిక్ ఇన్ అవర్ హాస్పిటల్ ఇస్ డిఫరెంట్ బట్ ఇన్ ది ఎగ్జామ్ ఇస్ ఎగ్జామ్ ఓరియెంటెడ్ సో దే ఆర్ ఫస్ట్ క్లినికల్ ఎగ్జామినేషన్ హీస్ ప్రొవిజనల్ డయాగ్నోస్ దెన్ ఓన్లీ దే Uh, let the cat out of the bag so then only no, that's how the examinations uh, thank you very much but that's how examinations killed education and medicine i know i know but that is the way how the thing is going on uh, please carry on sir uh, that that's why i have to go for another meeting ask sinivas kumar to join sir hello we'll ask the candidate to proceed with the physical uh, physical examination presentation at the end of which again uh, the rotation of the faculty will start with uh, krishnam raju and uh, okay? okay 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 right this uh, do present uh, yes, only one thing uh, whenever one uh, whenever senior teacher advisor say something don't do head nodding say yes sir uh-huh. don't do head nodding just to, just say yes sir and it be, it's a like a respect Uh, so continuing the ex- uh, examination there is no transverse ear lobe crease no xanthelisma no t- uh, tendon or palmar xanthomas no arcus senalis and erupt- eruptive xanthomas uh, pulse is 110 per minute regular normal volumic normal condition of vessel wall normal character with no radio radial delay no radio femoral delay all peripheral pulses are palpable equally on both sides with no carotid or renal ruy and pulse affects the facet our blood pressure is 140 by 90 mm hg in right upper limb 142 by 88 mm in left upper limb and 144 systolic in right lower limb in supine position our ankle brachial index is 144 by 140 which is 1.02 sir uh, jvp is uh, normal uh, mean jvp pressure with normal waveforms uh, with normal respiratory variation no hepato jugular uh, reflex respiratory rate is 18 per minute thoracic uh, abdominal and uh, saturation is 98% in room i think we'll pause for a minute here now you have the general examination sir. so i would like to know uh, what are the positive things or positive contribution from your general examination to make the clinical assessment don't repeat uh, everything only the positive uh, things uh she is having fever and her uh, pulse rate is 1 uh, 1 10 per minute regular uh, these are the only two uh, now say that there is some sinus tachycardia is there all right and then blood pressure is uh, not exactly normal but close to normal Hello? so she is on treatment so reasonable control i mean webni rafford shall call you then you said that ankle brachial index 1.02 which means that there isn't uh, any evidence of a peripheral arterial disease okay now you said something about jvp does it indicate anything to you about the cardiac function or rhythm or etc no sir so you say that jvp is normal so hence there is no evidence of right sided heart failure okay so some kind of uh, information has to be assembled and give your interpretation not just giving some finding but you should know how to get the information out of that integrate that information into your clinical assessment so there is sinus tachycardia blood pressure is under uh, not excellent control but reasonable control and then no evidence of peripheral arterial disease no evidence of right wing right side congestive heart failure that makes some sense dr krishnam rajgaru can i interrupt here please till till this point what are the things he could rule out he gave some differential diagnosis yeah. can he rule out some of the possibilities doctor what can you rule out from our so far no section aortic dissection i can rule out sir uh, hmm. there is okay. no and now why do you rule out you have to give the reason why you rule out so bp so, bp is uh, uh, not varying in uh, four limbs and uh, pulse is also is equal on all in all peripherally equal on so both there sides. is no evidence of any 
dissection to occlude any vessel. There can be dissection without occluding the vessel, mind you. Dissection does not always occlude the vessel. Ascending yes, aorta dissection may be there, but all the pulses may be present. But anyway, so all the pulses being present, it is unlikely that there is any occluding dissection. Should you add that? Occluding dissection of the aorta. Anything yes, else? Sir. Anything else you can rule out? Accelerated hypertension. Pardon? Accelerated hypertension. No, no, no. Right. That you can't rule out. Accelerated hypertension. That oh, you can't rule out. Before you talk something, always okay. think what you are you are committing something, but don't unnecessarily drag yourself into a uh, different situation. That's very important. Yeah. You have already given a blood pressure number which appears to be reasonably okay. So why do you bring in accelerated hypertension? You can rule out something else, like, for example, a pulmonary embolism. Yes. SpO2 we have given as a 90, uh, 98%. Respiratory is normal. Right? Yes, sir. With that, the a significant massive pulmonary embolism or submassive pulmonary embolism is unlikely. That is second. Third is somebody was raising the issue of... Uh, Out arteritis, that also can be ruled out. There was raising the possibility of about arteritis. Yeah, somebody raised that also can be ruled out from this till now. So pulmonary embolism and uh, our acute aortic dissection, obstructive, these two things can boldly be uh, ruled out. At this Rakesh, point. if all vitals are uh, very abnormal, like uh, instead of 140-90, if the patient is having hypertension, like a 90, if the rate is 130, What does that indicate regarding LV? And the prognosis of it varies based upon the vital, how you can decide whether the patient is having high risk. Uh, inappropriate sinus tachycardia. No, it's so not. Usually we expect if uh, uh, heart rate increases, BP should be... Uh, What are the determinants of cardiac output? Uh, heart rate, blood pressure, uh, uh, myocardial contractility and wall stress. No, it's not. What, the, what is the definition of cardiac output and how will you calculate what the stroke volume into? Heart rate. And then what are the determinants of stroke value? That you should know is preload, after load, myocardial contractility, because if myocardial severe dysfunction is there, definitely it will alter the low pressures, tachycardia. It has to maintain the cardiac output. When the stroke value is low, the rate will go up naturally to compensate to maintain the cardiac output. That means that there is severe myocardial damage or dysfunction. But here relatively reasonably well-preserved vitals that indicates myocardium is reasonably functioning well. But suppose same situation, because in the background of severe, recent onset of severe chest pain, breathlessness, suppose the massive myocardial infarction is there, definitely patient will have a low, a high sinus tachycardia, 130, 140 rate of and pressure of 90 or 100, and dyspnea, uh, tachy, tachypnea. There's are four vitals are very, very important. So based upon the history, now the general examination, pulmonary edema is unlikely. Now, because the respiratory rate, you are saying normal. Those things you can evaluate and tell. SPO2 also is normal. Yeah, SPO2 also normal. One comment here I would like to make is, Uh, you have a normal JVP and normal systemic pressure, oh. which is again against pulmonary embolism. Yeah. Because if there is a pulmonary embolism, clinically, physically speaking, the JVP will be elevated and systemic hypotension will be there if it is a significant submassive or massive pulmonary embolism. So your findings practically rule out, including dissecting aneurysm, pulmonary embolism, and also rules, rules out severe LV dysfunction with pulmonary edema. And yes, also yes, rules sir. out, as such a pointed out, our two arthritis. Can we move on? Or Srinivas yes. Kumar has a comment to make? Dr. Srinivas Kumar? Move on. Move on, okay. Let us move on. Coming to inspection, uh, precordium is normal. 
So what does that tell you? LV S3 in a patient who is uh, 50 plus. What does that tell you? Uh, LV S3 uh, indicates uh, left ventricular uh, 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 dysfunction. So ventricular gallop uh, heard after uh, S2, uh, uh, which is soft, uh, heard best with the diaphragm of the stethoscope. Uh, it indicates the uh, uh, after mitral diaphragm or bell, bell of the stethoscope. Sorry, sir. Bell of the stethoscope. Why bell? Uh, because it's a low pitch sound. Low frequency. Low. So, what is the band of frequency for S3? What is the audible range of frequencies of the human ear? Normal human ear. 30, 30 hertz. Above 30 hertz. Huh? Above? Mm -hmm. Lower yeah, range or range? There is so a band. Range, na? So, what is the audible frequency of the normal human ear? 30 to 20,000 hertz. Hertz, okay. Roughly. Yeah, Roughly, 20, yeah it is. It's 20 to 20,000 20, megahertz. So S3, S3, S4 have a common band. What is that band of frequency? I don't know, sir. Okay, it is about 100 to 200. Pardon, S3, no? S3, S4 are also, it's very unusual that it's not palpable but heard. Sometimes, most of the times, it's said that. He has written specifically no palpable sounds, sir. Actually, S4 is better palpable than audible. S4. S4. Yeah. But S3 is better heard than palpable. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. I just want to ask the candidate, what are the hemodynamic equivalents of S3? Uh, Non-compliant. What are the hemodynamic equivalents no, of? I don't know, sir. Don't know. Why it produce, what is the reason for S3? Uh, usually it uh, occurs after opening of mitral wall, early uh, feeling and uh, 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 in the compliant LVC. I will ask the question other way. If there is an S3, what are the things you can exclude? <clears throat> what are the things you can exclude? Exclude. We discussed about what it means when it is present. Now it is a inverted question. What can you exclude? There should be a free flow from left atrium to the left ventricle. So it is a rapid feeling. So that you have to think of those things. So uh, always why S3 is produced, why S4 is produced, uh, what is the reason for S4? What is the reason for if you read those things, then you can analyze and you can interpret. These are all very, very important. What is the Killips class for this patient now? He's an acute coronary syndrome. So you are not given the functional class here. Killips class. 
Philip Glass. Uh, I didn't examine during the episode of uh, SOB. No, no, no. Right now you have examined. Uh, Philip Glass one, sir. Philip Glass one. What is Philip Glass one? <clears throat> one to four. You can tell clear. Philip Glass one. No, uh, no sign. Uh, Philip Glass one. Glass. According to your S3, there is LV dysfunction. Ah. So it comes in class. It comes in class one or class two? Class two, less than uh, uh, one third. Class three is more than one third of chest crepts, and class four is uh, uh, in shock patient in shock. Class one. Uh, class is... yeah. So first class one is uncomplicated <clears throat> uh, MI. Class four is cardiogenic shock. Any it comes under class two, sir. Yeah, so basically, it is class two because you have got a evidence of LV dysfunction here. Mm -hmm. Now, and what else? are what are the other extra sounds which you might hear in a diastole? S three is one. Opening snap. Uh, uh, Opening snap. Yes. Marker, S four. Precardial knock, S4. What else? But they are all can be differentiated because they come in a different phases of the diastole. Opening snap comes immediately at the beginning of the diastole. Then um, S4 comes just before the first heart sound. What I have a the... fundamental question to the candidate. Is there a role for physical examination in a patient with coronary artery disease, acute? Yes, sir. Yes. So what are the what are, yes, physical signs, what are the physical signs of an acute myocardial infarction or acute ischemia? In other words, yes, uh, like uh, to rule out mechanical complications, there might be a uh, uh, MR. Uh, which is uh, most probably posterior papillary muscle uh, will be involved because it has single supply. Uh, in this, uh, there will be uh, uh, anterior eccentric jet. So the murmur... Uh, uh, so one is, no, no, one is structural abnormalities. Okay, any other reason? Any other benefit you are going to get? Uh, wall ruptures. Uh, yeah, there are structural abnormalities, yeah. we said. Free wall rupture, papillary muscle dysfunction, ventricular septal rupture. No, and palpation. Post-emo pericardial, there can be uh, pericardial rupture. Any other physical findings will be helpful to assess the. Uh, long term association of risk factors and uh, severity of the atheroma. Any other physical findings to assist the risk? Diabetic, hypertensive, past uh, uh, patient is having a dyslipidemia. On the appearance, there can be cancer, severe blockages, xanthalysma tendon and uh, palmar xanthomas and eruptive xanthomas can be present in dyslipidemia. Those will not uh, determine the prognosis. Those will only say patient is having a hereditary lipid, um, yeah. lipidemia or not. Associated with carotid artery disease, associated with peripheral vascular disease, all when these are there, definitely risk of coronary artery disease is very high. Why? Because it's a long-standing atheroma. See for any evidence of atheroma anywhere in the body like a carotid atheroma is there, peripheral vascular disease there. If these are there, definitely the risk is much more. That means atheroma is, uh, risk factors are playing for a longer time. So these patients will have a more risk compared to the, like a peripheral vascular disease you are ruling out, carotid artery disease you are uh, ruling out, then definitely uh, patient may not be having a stroke evidence. Patient may not be having a, uh, like a claudication, but a silent disease may be there. Those things are always seen. On inspection and palpation itself, you may find chest wall dyskinesia in the precardial region during ischemia. So that will tell you even without examining that there is possibility of a myocardial ischemia. 
So on auscultation, you may find third heart sound or fourth heart sound, or a murmur, systolic murmur, or a pericardial rub, as you have said. Sometimes uh, a continuous murmur, due if there is a pseudo aneurysm of the ventricle, the flow into uh, LV2 pseudo aneurysm and back can give rise to a to and fro murmur, or occasionally a soft continuous murmur. And then it has been described also that there may be a murmur originating from the LAD, which can be heard as a mid-diastolic murmur over the precardial. <clears throat> Though it is not common. I, I think I heard it only a couple of times. So, uh, but it is extremely rare. So these are some of the uh, things which you can pick up on physical examination during a acute coronary syndrome. In addition to any evidence of a pulmonary infarct, et cetera, et cetera, or a carotid brui, which is a atherosclerotic marker. Mm -hmm. So abdominal auscultation will give you a brui, which again is an atherosclerotic marker. So some of these things can help you in narrowing down your diagnosis. And uh, the as far as third heart sound is concerned, the real difficulty is in distinguishing the third heart sound from pericardial knock and a tumor plop sound, right? Yes, so sir. there are multiple sounds which are described in the diastole. Some you have said, opening snap, third sound, fourth sound, uh, but you have to add pericardial knock, tumor plop sound, and sometimes diastole clicks. Diastole clicks may be present mm -hmm. only in diastole. And then also extra cardiac sound, extra cardiac sounds coming from the mediastinum or the pacemaker sounds or the gastric sounds. Those things also may be heard. So we need to be careful about interpreting the diastolic sounds. If That's JHT what I is elevated in a patient with acute MI, suspected <laughs> exposure, <laughs> what should you suspect? Think of think, sir, actually, the chat also is raising some interesting uh, aspects. You can read yes. through that. Because yeah, yeah, yeah. outside the panelists, they can't uh, see those. So you can read that if it is interesting and answer it. It will be good, sir. Yeah, yeah, sure. So I'm asking, uh, suppose if the jugular venous pressure is elevated in a patient suspected of having an MI, what should you suspect? It does have a lot of uh, importance. Right ventricular infarction. Mm -hmm. So, if there's an RVMI, which is the infarction rate artery? Most probably 80% of the time it's RCA, 20% of the time it can be LCX. It is never <coughs> LCX. It is never LCX. RCA, where is wrapped the level around, of Sorry, wrapped around LAD, sir. Wrapped around LAD also, you don't get it. Mm -hmm. it, is, it. It localizes it to the RCA, definitely. Proximal RCA. Diagonal, diagonal to the acute marginal. Okay. Yes, sir, I am yeah. back. Can you? Yeah, yeah, yeah sure. Okay. Uh, I just yeah. came in when you were asking about a Philip, Philip classification. Yeah, yeah, yeah. From there, I am hearing. Yeah, okay, okay. Philip classification came in 1976 in AJC. <laughs> Philip and Kimball. Yeah, yeah, right. Okay, then what about the, you know, are we through with this uh, physical examination? Because... Mm -hmm. We are exceeding the time. Examination, uh, yeah, normal, sir. Mm. So, done. so kindly summarize the findings and then uh, Dr. Krishnam oh, Raju will start again. Uh, he's having sinus tachycardia with uh, hypertension uh, with LVS3, sir. Mm. So, uh, no, you say that it's a postmenopausal 50 plus woman with multiple risk factors and also a family history, has a typical story of a acute coronary syndrome, right? And then systemic hypertension is under uh, reasonable control. And there is no evidence of dissection by physical examination, no evidence of uh, significant pulmonary embolism by physical examination. And there is sinus, mild sinus tachycardia, and there is a third heart sound on auscultation, but otherwise cardiac system examination is fine mm -hmm. and JVP is normal. If that is so, up to this point, 
So what is your diagnosis? Acquired uh, heart disease, coronary heart disease, uh, 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 unstable angina, uh, NIA class 2, uh, with sinus tachycardia, uh, with uh, intermittent episodes of uh, uh, LVF, uh, with no PAH, no infective endocarditis. And, uh, uh, How do we know PAH? No pulmonary artery hypertension. Not examined so far, you know. Can, can I interrupt him? Yes, yes. Dr. Raju? Yes, see, yes. One side is showing, see, MBCP is elevated, tropes are, tropes are elevated. He's saying unstable angina. Unstable angina. Uh, uh, he, unstable angina when that. your card no, is not coming to lab evaluation as yet. Pardon? He has not come into lab evaluation. So far, yes. it is on the screen, but he has but not he, come to that. I not mention that unstable angina. I can say acute coronary syndrome. That is acceptable. The only acute cause. Uh, you don't know. It may be STEMI. It may be in, in STEMI. Mm -hmm. uh, and James, after that, you, once you see the ECG only, you come to that diagnosis. Yes, sir. And James and the ECG. Now, only broad, you have to mention like acute coronary syndrome. And, and one more thing, unnecessarily, you should not bring no infective endocarditis, yeah. no PH. He has not yet come to that level. Okay. Even there's no indication to say no infect endocarditis here. There's no, it's not a valvular heart disease or congenital heart disease. So, unnecessarily, you should not bring that uh, differential diagnosis or <coughs> add on diagnosis at this stage. Yeah, that's right. I agree with you. <coughs> Everything which you have illustrated in history and general examination, you need to interpret that only up to that level. You may be right, you may be wrong at the end of it. That is the purpose of uh, taking history. That is the purpose of doing a general examination. So uh, I will just summarize how I see it. You say 50 years plus postmenopausal woman with multiple atherosclerotic risk factors and with a family history, classical uh, acute coronary syndrome history wise, and then systemic hypertension under control and there is evidence of LV dysfunction because there is an S3. There is no evidence of RV dysfunction because JVP is normal. There is no clinical dysfunction. And there is no evidence of dissection, no evidence of pulmonary embolism, no evidence of significant pulmonary edema. To that extent, I think I will be willing to walk. Uh, can we move on to the lab evaluation? On uh, blood investigations, our HP is 10.5 gram percent, WBC is 11,000, creatinine is uh, 1.1, uh, cholesterol, uh, total cholesterol 260, LDL is 140, HDL is 42, uh, triglycerides are 90, CPKMB levels are 120, uh, high sensitivity troponin 4.8 uh, nanogram per deciliter, NT pro BNP, uh, it, this, uh, this is a uh, this is at uh, uh, present station, sir. Mm -hmm. This is on 12th. Uh, NT Pro BNP uh, 1100 and HSCRP is uh, 9 uh, milligram per deciliter. This is the current data or the Karim Nagar data? This is current data, sir. Uh, okay. In our hospital, it was done in biochemical data. What is the blood sugar value? 90. Yes, sugar value here. Blood sugar value, any A1C? Uh, blood sugar is 220 milligram per deciliter, sir. Uh, and you are not mentioned, very important, no? uncontrolled or controlled. And uh, uh, HbA1C? Uh, we didn't it, sir. HbA1C, we didn't it. Oh, you have to do it. What is the importance of HbA1C in acute myocardium in ACS? Uh, more HbA1C, poor, uh, poor outcomes or recurrent uh, events. These are the basic investments which can show the prognosis of the patient, A1C high, admission sugar very high, and creatine very high, all not risk factors. So you can indirectly, based upon the test also, if the GFR low, creatine is high, A1C higher the A1C, the risk is more, uncontrolled diabetes higher the sugar value, the risk is more, so CP can be higher the value, higher the risk drop, all these things you have to indicate. It is for you to decide the prognosis of the patient. Now go back to the lab data. Don't move to the ECG now. Go back to the lab. Now, how do you interpret? You have told me. 
No, I just wanted to know what the LDLC, was it a derived value or a directly measured value in this patient? It's directly measured. Okay. Now, how do you interpret this data? What is normal? What is abnormal? She is anemic, you know, 10.5 grams. Uh, yes, sir. Total cholesterol is elevated. LDLC is elevated. Yeah, she has low hemoglobin. She is postmenopausal, 50 plus. You would expect it to be at least 13 grams. So she has anemia. And two, do you think her uh, lipids are okay? I elevated, sir. Total cholesterol is elevated. LDLC is elevated, sir. Particularly in HDL value, Nari, they are not acceptable numbers. HDL value is it normal for that lady? No, sir. Uh, diabetic uh, above 40 years, it should be less than LDLC should be less than 70, sir. HDL value, I'm saying HDL value is it normal or abnormal? What uh, 42 male? What is the value? Normal the more than 60, sir. It is uh, below. Uh, uh, it is abnormal. 42 is abnormal. Decrease. I'll just make one uh, comment which I have read in a year back. There was a couple of studies published. Always we were taught that higher the HDL, the better. Lower the HDL, the worse. But now they say HDL in the range of 40 to 70 is good. But if it is less than 40, are more than 70. Even more than 70 is not good for the heart. <laughs> that, that is uh, some conclusions which were drawn. Uh, I think Dr. Dayasagara probably, I think, has some information on that. No, actually, you know, it was mentioned. I think basically it is not the quantity of HDL, but the quality of HDL that really matters. Right, the crystal size. Yeah, crystal SDL one or SDL two? Yeah, that's you know there are all subdivisions are there. Subdivisions. I think the emphasis. But he mentioned the sixty, from the sir, 60 is the, forty is the level which is taken for women. No, no, for no, no. It is for men is it should be more than forty, and for women it should 50. be more than fifty. Fifty. 50. Yeah, that is the standard. Uh, that is the standard uh, requirements. But now the emphasis has moved away from the HDL, Sometime. saying that it is not the, what you call the yeah. quantity, but the quality of the HDL that seems to matter. <laughs> and all attempts to improve the HDL by the drug therapy has been a totally unsuccessful affair, including the administration of nicotinic acid to raise mm -hmm. the HDL, which was a disaster. Because there were more CV events compared to those who did not receive nicotinic acid to raise the HDL. Be that as it may, that HDL is, is de-emphasized now. Now, no, uh, main, uh, back uh, the main emphasis now, uh, no, I'm not a panelist probably. There are four people, uh, so I won't interpret. Okay. Sorry. No, you made a comment. Yes, sorry. Yes, sorry. Okay. There is one, one or two comments I want to make. In acute MI, there will be the levels are not reliable. Uh, the total uh, total cholesterol, LDL, and these levels are not reliable. And usually it has to be done in a basal stage. But unfortunately, we don't have any data. Most of the ACS cases, the blood sample is collected within 24 hours. Next day morning, when the patient is admitted, next day morning on empty stomach, they, uh, overnight fasting, they collect the sample. So if you see scientifically, this data, total